Hello. Hi. Thank you for coming. Um, so uh, you should have all been handed note. This is really loud, isn't it? You should have all been handed note cards when you came in. Yes. Okay. So we're gonna do kind of moderated questions along the way as we're doing. We're we're talking about stuff today. Um, so we've already gotten a few up here, and if you want to just write down questions as you think of them, uh, you can. Do that, and about in the middle, we'll have you hand them down the aisles, and someone will come and collect them, and we'll take a look and answer some of your questions. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah, cool. Awesome. Okay, well, thanks for coming. We, um, this panel was sort of changed forms in many ways, but I'm so glad to have these awesome co-panelists with me. We're going to talk a bit about just generally like being women talking about games on the internet and how great it is and how much it sucks sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and everything sort of encompassing in that. Um, so I will just start with introducing myself. I'm Anisha Sarkeesian. I run Feminist Frequency, which is a video web series looking at the representations of women in popular culture. Hello, everyone. I'm Catherine Cross. I am a sociologist, a PhD student at the City University of New York Graduate Center. I do a lot of writing and criticism of video games and online culture, and one of my central research areas is online harassment. And I was a co-editor at the feminist website The Border House for several years, and I currently am a columnist of Feministing and a frequent contributor to Bitch Magazine. Um, I am. <laughs> I'm Carolyn Pettit. I uh, am a, uh, an editor and a critic uh, at GameSpot.com. I write game reviews and features about games and video game culture. Sweet. So in thinking about what exactly we were going to talk about in this panel and sort of operationalizing what it means to be interneting while female. One of the issues that came up for us was the fact that, you know, this has been discussed a lot in some recent articles too, that there is increasingly, as there's more discussion of harassment of women online, there is also a kind of weird commodification of it, where we are expected to sort of bear our experiences and all of their lurid glory to get people to look at how awful it is and look at all the mean things that people say to us. But rarely is there space ever given for us to interpret our experience. And that is a uh, common theme that tends to run through a lot of different types of uh, victimization of women, whether you're talking about uh, any kind of violence against women, whether you're talking about uh, sexual violence, whether you're talking about violence against trans women or sex workers, it always comes back to the bear your scars as a victim, but don't you dare interpret your experience or make it about something bigger. And so what we're going to try to do today, I think, is to break the rules a little bit on that score that we are actually going to interpret for you, tell you about what we have learned through analyzing online harassment, what's happened to us, our loved ones, or f our friends and colleagues, what it means, what we've learned from it, possibly joke a little bit about it in some decidedly uncouth ways, and hopefully uh, learn and ascend into a happy future on little boats. Right? <laughs> um, or we can just talk about cupcakes. That's uh, That was our original plan, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I, which question do we so, want to kick off with? So I actually, so we have a couple of questions that we came up to ask each other to sort of like frame some of these conversations. And I thought um, an interesting one would be to start with Carolyn in like, you write game reviews yeah. and occasionally you talk about women yeah. and things. So how do you navigate that in a mainstream space? Yeah, so it's, it is interesting, right, because um, I, like I am operating within the framework of like a, a mainstream gaming site. And I have to like, I feel like um, I, I have to acknowledge that in the work that I do. Um, so uh, um, a, a quote that I often like to refer back to when I think about this is a quote that um, Manola Dargis, who's a film critic for the New York Times, she wrote a lengthy criticism of the film uh, Blue is the Warmest Color. And, um, but in that criticism, uh, so she said this, um, talking about her experience as a woman who writes about, about films for a you know, major media outlet. She says, the truth is, if I were hung up about every predatory director or every degrading image of a woman, I couldn't be a film critic. 
So I watch loving movies that don't necessarily love or even like women. And I feel like working for GameSpot, it's a similar kind of approach that I have to take to games. And I have to sort of say, my a thing that I, I say sometimes is like, if issues of representation were kind of built into how we at major sites like review and score games, perhaps to the extent that they should be, uh, if you're talking about like a 10 point scale, hardly any game would get higher than like a four, right? Because it's just, it's just such a, 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 such a systemic problem, the, the way that women are portrayed in games, but I can't, I, I, in the position that I'm in, I, like, I cannot do that. And what's funny though is that, is that just the very, very small amount of commentary on these issues that I've done in, in my work. Like, it's a very small percentage of my reviews at all that, that t touch upon issues of representation of women in the games that I'm reviewing. And yet, um, in the broader community, there is this uh, perception, you know, that I am like this um, feminist crusader who is like just constantly r like ranting about these issues. Like you look at the, in the comments section of just about any review that I write and it's like, oh, well the real reason Carolyn, you know, gave this game, of the score she gave it is, you know, because she thought it was sexist or, or what, you know, like she, Carolyn would like this game because the playable character is female or whatever. And it, it's just crazy how, like I feel like the mainstream gaming media, both the websites and publications that cover games and the games, uh, the production of games, games as they're, as they're produced and marketed, have kind of catered largely to the straight male demographic for so long that now any attempt whatsoever to raise these issues is seen as like a, a, a bringing about an imbalance in the natural order. And I think the games industry has created this problem for itself, right? This is like by, by being, by functioning the way it did for so long, and so now we're in this position of any push up against, against that kind of status quo results in this tremendous reaction of fear and anger and uh, because we're challenging the entitlement that a group of people has come to, to feel over the whole realm of video games. Right. Totally. So like, in, it's interesting to hear you talk about working at a mainstream gaming site because I'm independent and I almost do what I want to some degree, which <laughs> with a, a lot of limitations. Um, and it, it reminds me that the work that we can do as independent writers or independent critics um, and as readers of those sites in lieu of completely changing the way that press works, or gaming press works, is to continue doing this kind of work and to do the, have these really strong opinions and calling things out in ways that a lot of reviewers aren't doing to put to, to start shifting the culture of gaming sites to, to start being like, hey, we actually want to hear about this stuff. We actually want you to acknowledge that this game might have awesome mechanics and it's fun to play, but it hates women. And that should be something included in reviews, I think, because I would like to know that as someone who might potentially be buying this game or that game, right? And I think a lot of people would like to know that. Yeah, but, but there is so commonly the perception that if you even bring that up as an issue, you are the one with the, the agenda, right? That it's not people for, for such a, uh, for the dominant uh, kind of culture that is, that is uh, most vocal at, at a lot of gaming websites uh, and anyway, um, certainly not in gaming at large, because I do believe that, that games are, are uh, we, we all know that games are played and enjoyed and made by, uh, by a very diverse group of people, but the sense in the culture that has developed is that, you know, when I bring that up, it's, it's me that has the agenda, and it's not the, the game itself that has this, this, these really troubling, problematic, political, you know, messages that it's communicating to anyone who plays it. You're just a social justice warrior, yeah, aren't you? SJ, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. And actually, that's an interesting point to bring up because I remember when you and I were talking about this, Carol, and that you had said that uh, now that your, your famous uh, GTA V review has now sort of colored the perception of all of your other reviews, even when you explicitly don't talk about gender mm -hmm. politics, that that's now, that being a feminist is now assumed to be a permanent subtext. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's something that ha, like has colored. I think the the whole. I mean, and, and you know, to an extent, like I wanna I wanna own that, right? I mean, I want to to say like I I'm not afraid. 
you know, I don't care if you hate me, really. Like, I, I, I mean, I don't want you to hate me, but I would much rather be on GameSpot and saying these things and upsetting people than I would be not, uh, you know, not voicing these, these thoughts and these feelings and these issues at all. Um, I'm happy to, if someone needs to be like that kind of scapegoat or whatever, like, because I, I know the reality is when you bring up some of these things, at this point, like, I, I didn't go into writing that GTA 5 review with any illusions that it was just going to go down <laughs> smoothly. Like, I, I was like, I was like, okay, you know, I'm devoting like one paragraph and a really long review to this, uh, and that is going to be the only thing that anyone reacts it's to. It's amazing. You gave it a nine. I know, like, <laughs> right? And, and I, think, I think it's so funny, the, cause Anita, you and I were talking earlier, you know, so when, it's, when it goes against the dominant cultural perspective, um, it, the smallest thing will, will stand out, will get all the attention, but you have kind of the opposite problem at times where, like, in your videos, like, you'll be very explicit about, uh, you know, this is an issue that affects men, too, you, you know, and talking about all sorts of things, and yet viewers seem to just completely miss that, that aspect of your videos and, you know, at, react like, what about, you know, what about the men, or what about... You, <laughs> and, what about the men? What about the men? <laughs> um. <laughs> So sorry, I keep. Um, <laughs> so it, so we were we were just talking about this. How okay? And when when I go to make a video or to write the script, I often I mean me and my co-writer spend an enormous <clears throat> amount of time going. Okay, what are all of the counter arguments? Right? What are all the things that people are going to come at me with? Like I'm surprised that we haven't started making bingo cards to hand out with the videos <laughs> being like, you know. So we incorporate all of that and. It takes an enormous amount of time and effort to make it seem seamless and like a part of the story that we're trying to tell and a part of the criticism. And so it's amazing to me how like in the last video uh, where we talked about women as background decoration and how um, women are often abused as texture, right, to make a, an environment seem gritty and real, um, that I, I literally say you can do this to male NPCs too, but here's how it's different. And all of the criticisms immediately were like, but you can do it to men too. And I'm like, <laughs> I know, I said that. <laughs> right, and so, so it's interesting in how, like, what's happened around me is I, like, I am not a human being. I am that evil feminazi that wants to take all games away, um, mm -hmm. that doesn't play games, that doesn't know anything about anything, and that is like a con artist trying to lie to everybody, right? Like, there's all of these conspiracy theories. And so what's happening is that these people are, like they don't, they don't care what I actually say, right? They're not listening to the words that I'm presenting that are carefully crafted uh, specifically for a very broad audience. They just go, what can we attack her with? No matter what I do or say, right? So it's, sometimes I feel this like double-edged sword because I'm very careful about what I say, right? I'm very careful about, I spent hours trying to compose a tweet. Like this is the level <laughs> to, of like sort of, uh, scrutiny and pressure that we feel under uh, in making these videos and being a presence as feminist frequency online. Um, but sometimes I'm like, well, it doesn't matter because no matter what I say, they're gonna come after me, right? And, and yeah, and so that's, it's, it's different in that like, I don't think, I'm sure this happens, but people aren't like necessarily trying to find everything you say that's possibly the worst ever. But when you right. do say it, they're just like, how dare you, yeah. right? With yeah. me, it's just like, you said words, how dare you? <laughs> like. Yeah, like with some of the conspiracy stuff directed at you, Anita, it's like some chemtrails level bullshit there, just <laughs> in terms of. Like, I'm surprised in the videos they're not wearing like tinfoil hats and shit. <laughs> It's like, like, so, sorry, I just have to share one example. So oh, one yeah. example of, and this could segue into harassment stuff, but um, one example is that I caused my own abuse. So like the level of victim blaming, right, is just remarkable. Like there are hundreds of videos made with this, this narrative of me and my feminist army posted on 4chan to get the abuse, to get the attention, to get the money, to make the videos and to be famous, right? Like that like I would ever, ever do that to myself or wish that upon anyone else. And they, they take this and run with it. They really genuinely believe that I have manufactured the harassment. Now, the level of like the hatred of women and the victim blaming that goes into that kind of thought is remarkable, right? It gives you an idea of 
the space that we're dealing with and that this is a very loud, uh, angry part of the gaming community that I think affects all of us in a lot of ways, right? If you're not directly being attacked, you're seeing it happen, right? You're seeing it on comments, on message boards. You're seeing women and queer folks and people of color being shut out of the community by this very vitriolic group of people who just like hate everything <laughs> except their video games. What were you say? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, and you are trying to take take all the video games I away. It's I I I always I always love the equation, and I hear it all the time of of your kind of criticism with censorship that you are trying to like impose on you know somehow on our society some sort of like cens censorship regime where like all of these where people just cannot create. The, the you know can't express the amazing creative freedom that results in in these rich portrayals of you know grizzled v white violent dudes and damsels in distress you know the, all the nuance and that gets poured into them you're, you're trying to um, did yeah you, did you want to speak to the um Sorry, do the, do I just you have a really good analysis around the like larger culture of gaming and how it affects women. Oh yeah, one thing that I've been talking a lot about recently, and uh, in a book chapter that Anita and I co-wrote uh, very recently, we describe this in greater detail. But extant in the wider culture of gaming is what I call a sort of male gamer terror dream, where there is this pervasive, deep-seated fear that manifests, not just in sexism or even in other types of prejudice per se, but just in the general level of vitriol that is sort of the background radiation to all of gamer culture. So even if you're talking about something that isn't necessarily quote unquote political, you still see that, that anger, that outrage. And it comes from this ultimate fear that many gamers, uh, especially young men, were raised with in both this generation and the one preceding us of fearing that something in the culture was going to take the games away. It was either Christian conservatives or perhaps censorious government officials, like some of us remember in the 90s, you know, Hillary Clinton doesn't talk about it anymore, but she had jumped on um, Joe Lieberman's bandwagon of, you know, violent video games cause Columbine and so forth. There were, have been a lot of efforts, um, you know, we all remember Jack Thompson, I'm sure. Uh, you know, and these people, you know, whether it's Jack Thompson or the guy who wrote the chick tracks about Dungeons and Dragons, there is this pervasive sense that somebody in the culture is going to take the games away, that we are always just one step away from losing it. And so that instinct that now metastasizes into this reflexive outrage that occurs whenever there is even the slightest criticism of gaming as an enterprise is always seen as sort of the thin end of the wedge of taking everything away and Toto. And so it makes it very difficult to be a critic in general. And I argue that, I mean, well, first of all, how many of us remember the hoopla around Mass Effect 3's ending? How many of us remember all the hoopla about all of Dragon Age 2? Okay, it manifests in that too, because all the outrage over that, the absolute hyperbolic anguish that was probably worse than a reaper invasion ultimately <laughs> was it grew out of not just an artistic criticism because certainly one could say well yes I could make a criticism of how minimalist Mass Effect 3's ending was and I felt like I didn't tie together the series very well one could say that but it got turned into Bioware is destroying games this is the end of role playing as we know it RPGs are dead you know blah 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 right and so it all these things linking together are cultural filaments that tie into this rope that binds us all together in a culture of fear. And what ends up happening is that that then interlaces with extant cultures of sexism, of transphobia, of racism, where then all of the people that those groups are, uh, are targeting become the representations of this existential threat. Trans people are going to destroy video games. Women are going to destroy video games, right, et cetera, et cetera. Or people with disabilities and all of their complaints are going to destroy video games. What the fuck, right? Everything is about these very high stakes. And I, don't it comes from this hmm? I don't think I've ever heard you swear before. I don't think I've ever heard you swear before. 
Sorry. No. <laughs> I think it's great. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a very rare thing. You all are being given the VIP experience of Catherine Cross yeah. swearing. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, but I, I absolutely think that, and I do feel like this is, a, again, a problem that the games industry needs to, own, needs to take responsibility for and claim ownership of it, that, it's, that it has created for itself by catering exclusively to, uh, or you know, almost exclusively to kind of straight males for so long uh, um, that that the sense of entitlement to the entire domain of games is so strong that any game that you know su that suggests that it might be welcoming to other types of players or even encouraging other types of players to come into gaming and say you know gaming has things to offer you too you can be welcome here too is such a threat one of the one of my favorite um, private message comments that I've ever gotten from a reader on GameSpot was in the wake of my uh, Gone Home review, I, I got this uh, message from a reader, and it was, it was pretty well worded and well thought out. It wasn't the typical, you know, just um, sweary, hateful rant. It, it, the reader thought that he was coming from this kind of very reasonable, thoughtful perspective, but what he was saying is um, essentially, well, you know, Carolyn, what you, sh you shouldn't have given Gone Home such a high score because if, uh, if, you know, game designers see games like Gone Home getting so much acclaim, then we're not going to have uh, traditional <laughs> games anymore, you know? We're not, and like, like, we're not, like, yes, exactly. Go everyone now, like, uh, uh, they're going to stop making Call of Duty and pour all their like hundred million dollar budgets into generating like love stories about like young lesbians or whatever. It's like, like right? Which right? I mean, awesome. that would be yeah, that would be fucking awesome. But it's like, don't worry, nobody is going to take your your military shooters away, right? I mean, there isn't like a limit. It's not like having these games that are for other people means that that there's less games that are the kinds of games that you like, right? I mean. The, yeah. The gaming ah. thermodynamics. Oh Games God. can never be created or destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's, if you have questions, why don't you hand them down now so we can start sort of integrating them into this conversation we're having. Um, and someone, I hope, in a blue shirt will walk by and pick them up. So just hand them down the aisles so that you don't have to actually get up if you have any. And speaking of questions, uh, we already do have some up here. And one of the themes that emerged was um, there were some actually a couple of very heartfelt ones, but uh, about dealing with online harassment, both as a, a woman with a career in this industry, and also just sort of dealing with possible burnout or you know what I would call cynicism. And I think a great question for uh, both of our other panelists is, in the wake of all of the harassment that you've both experienced, like how do you avoid becoming completely cynical about your lives or about gaming in general? Because the, just the overwhelming weight of all of that hatred seems to show like the, the very worst <coughs> possible face of humanity, of gaming, etc. And it sometimes can be difficult, I think, to contextualize that more widely. It, it is absolutely a, a struggle, and I mean, there are absolutely days where, uh, you know, I I don't feel like I I know how to cope with it or know how to deal with it, and it and it, it can you know break me down, and I want to just run away from the industry and never come back. But um, I guess I I look at a few things. I mean, I, I look at at ways in which I feel like the conversations are starting to evolve, right? I, I, I look at things like what happened at, uh, at E3 this year where um, the discussion around, you know, um, the lack of female playable characters in Assassin's Creed, which, I mean, a few years ago, I don't think anyone would have, like, batted an eye at that were, you know, no one would have like raised the question, why are there no female playable characters? Didn't right. So with Battlefield Four, they thank you. With Battlefield Four, last at the last E3 two right. years ago or whatever, they said this. They, the same thing happened. They cut women out of multiplayer, and they gave all of these reasons. And it was not a major headline. Yeah. Right. And, and, and this year it was. Right. I mean, Ubisoft. people not only raised the question, but then when the when the answer is given and it's such absurd bullshit, like, <laughs> I mean, people kind of 
call them out on it. They're like, I think there is, the, the sense is starting to seep into a, a broader uh, sex, you know, section of gamer culture that like, okay, it doesn't really, it doesn't maybe always make sense that games are designed the way they are with, uh, you know, with like, the idea that, oh, female play playable characters, you know, can't be part of the budget, but we can spend all this money uh, on, you know, just have, creating these cities and these environments and these c cars or whatever, like all this stuff that's, but, but pl female playable characters, that would be a, an expense that's like, oh, no, we can't, we can't possibly. Um, so I look at things like that, like how the conversation is shifting, and, um, and just on a personal level, I mean, I, I I do, since because I feel so much like gaming culture it, and games themselves are worth fighting for and that, and because I grew up with the idea that games are for everyone and because that's just always been a, a, an, an intrinsic belief of mine and I want to see that belief kind of manifested in, in the, the real world, I mean, I, I take a lot of strength from from the positive comments and the encouragement that, that that I get on a personal level, you know, when people say, "Oh, you know, seeing you as a trans woman on, on GameSpot, you know, really uh, it means a lot to me," or, or, you know, it's it's a it's a drop in the bucket compared to the the sheer number of, of negative comments that I get, but they they really do um, kind of help me stay hopeful in some of the the darker moments of of this ongoing struggle. Um, I am so cynical. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know how you do the work that I do without being cynical. Like, I'm literally, it's amazing how many times you're like, oh, I've just found the worst possible thing. Like, there's no way a game could do anything worse to a woman. And then, you know, you do a little more research and you find another thing and another thing. And you're like, Jesus, how is that even possible? So, like, I, without hesitation, I am incredibly cynical. And I think that it's an appropriate response to how awful things really are. Um, but one thing, so I, I, I always struggle with the like, what gives you hope? How do you like, I don't really know how to answer that. And I feel like I'm supposed to have this kind of, you know, like uplifting answer to people because, you know, I talk about this, I should have some hope. And I, I Samantha, um, Samantha Allen wrote this thing a few years ago and in it she said, I have hope even though I have no reason to. And that always resonated with me because I do have hope, but sometimes I can't articulate it, right? Sometimes I don't know why, but I would never keep doing this and I would never put myself through the shit that I go through to do this if I didn't really think that real change could happen, right? And that this is meaningful and important. Um, did you wanna say something? Yeah, and as, uh, as somebody who studies this, even when it's not directed at me, it can be a profoundly depressing exercise to like read through lots and lots of online comments. I mean, I've, you know, my partner always says, and like, Catherine, why are you reading the comments? I'm like, I'm working, honey, it's okay. <laughs> you know, it's, it's research. And this, uh, this delightful chap at a store in the mall near here asked me what I did, and I told him, and he's like, oh wow, that must be fun. Like, well, not with the part of the internet I study. But, um, and so, and I have also had harassment directed at me, not always for the things I write in gaming, but I also do a lot of general political writing and people have used a lot of very transphobic abuse to describe me and talk about me and drive hatred in my direction, irrational, unthinking hatred. And it is very, very difficult. What I always keep in mind for myself to prevent myself from burning out, not just the sense of, uh, that beautifully nameless hope, but also just the sense that at the end of the day, every single person that has ever attacked me or my loved ones is a human being that has been deeply malformed in some way morally by the nature of the society, turned into a weapon against others. And there's a profound tragedy in that as well. And for me, the hope that keeps me going is to remember not only that I can emancipate my sisters, with this work, but also everyone else, including those who are engaged in this harassment, because it's ultimately poisonous and corrosive for everyone that is involved in it. You know, the, a lot of the people that attack Anita, for instance, that's practically all they do 
It's really scary. They devote the better part of their creative energies and their lives just to creating stuff to attack her. And imagine what has been robbed from the world with the loss of all of that creative energy, ultimately. You know, and so I... I <laughs> And so thinking about that and thinking that you know, we can ultimately save everybody, including pe save people from themselves, that also keeps me going, that that's the, the legitimacy of my work and understanding and researching why this happens and hopefully finding a way out of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I do, sorry. I do try to, try to think when I, when I am getting the focus of, of her, get, when I am getting a, a, a good amount of harassment like I did in the wake of the GTA 5 review, for instance, I do try to think of it in those terms that this is really, it's not really about me at all. It is, it is about, you know, it is, it is a reflection of the fears and, and prejudices that, and the feelings of entitlement that, that have built up in, in them and, and a reflection of the fact that, that just anyone raising these, these kinds of concerns um, is threatening to them, and uh, and I, it is it is sad to you know to, to see people who are so uh, so kind of imprisoned by their own fears and their own kind of problematic ideologies that that that, that is what happens is that they lash out in these ways like that that is that is the way that they process it and kind of express it. So. Um... I think that there's two things here, right? One is being cynical about games, and one is being cynical about the harassment. And they're interwoven in a lot of ways, but for the sake of this conversation, we can kind of separate that out. Um, I think, uh, and I, I think that you may have experienced this too, is that like, you know, we get, you know, the new games come out and they're like brooding white dude 568 and women are damsels and killed and just like, oh my God, why are we doing this again and again? Have we learned nothing? Um, but when games come out that really touch you is when you're reminded of like the possibility yeah, yeah. of what games can be, right? And, and the vision that I have for what games can be, it, these are like micro pieces of that, right? So games like Gone Home was incredibly moving. Um, I recently replayed Papo and Yo, which just is a devastating game that, that you know, it's not fun to play, but it's like, wow, a game can, a, like an, an awesome, beautiful game can really speak to a, uh, can speak to very real issues that we face um, in a personal and larger systemic way. And those things give me so much hope, right? I'm, I'm, those give me the sense of being uplifted a little bit. Um, in terms of the harassment, I, I was at a, a panel in Sweden a few years back, and uh, this woman, we were at like an after party or whatever, and I was sitting on the couch totally exhausted, and this woman came up to me, um, who was actually on the panel with me, she's the e-host sports, uh, yeah. e-sports host, <laughs> and, um, and she just seemed very like tired, and she just, this exasperated sense uh, came up to me and said, does it not affect you? Like, does the harassment never bother you? And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> like, I don't understand like, how anyone could come to that conclusion. And I realized part of it was because of my presentation, right? Of how I presented what was happening to me. Um, and getting through, I mean, so the harassment, it's been well over two years and it hasn't stopped or died down. It is consistent every day, right? Um, but the beginning of it was very motivating, right? It was, okay, what are we gonna do with this? This is happening. I, I can't stop it from happening. How am I going to turn this into something positive? And taking it into action is what let me get through it, right? Um, in addition to having support and all of that, that kind of thing. Um, and I realized that in that process, I really didn't want the harassers to see me being upset, right? To see that it can affect me. And so I was very strategic and, you know, I still am about how I presented this information. And that, that conversation in Sweden made me think like, Fuck them! Like this is more important that women realize that I that this this sucks, right? That it hurts. That it's okay to feel bad about it, right? It's okay to be angry about it, um, and to take that anger and to do something, right? Um, and you know, collectively organize, come together, figure out some way that we change this culture so that this doesn't keep happening. Um, and one of the one of the things about being sort of very visible in terms of being harassed is having a lot of people come to you, being like, I'm being harassed, these things are happening to me. Um, 
Carolyn sharing her harassment that she gets with me, like being a bystander is hard. It's really hard to watch this. And I don't think I fully appreciated that until I was sort of put into this position. Um, so like, what do allies do? Like, what do we do when we're in a bystanding position of watching this happen to someone we care about? I, I mean, I think it's important to have those people, you know, for instance, in, if there's a comment thread on, on you know, GameSpot where a bunch of people are, uh, you know, piling on me and, and saying nasty, horrible things because I'm trans or because I'm a feminist or for whatever reason, because I'm a woman, um, to have anyone, you know, in the comments uh, just kind of call them out and say like that, you know, this isn't cool. And to, to just try, you know, it's not, to, to, to try to start changing the, the, what's acceptable and not acceptable in, in that culture. It, it, even if it's just, because I know that that's not easy to be that person who's gonna come out and say, you know, go against the, the tide and against what's perceived as acceptable and normal. And to say, you know, actually what you're saying and doing is, is, really, is really fucked up and it's not okay to, to do that. Like that's not easy for that person, and it and I think it, it can, if 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 a if one person does it, and then maybe another person sees that that other person did it. That, that I, I have to believe that the culture in these kinds of comments and around games in general can be changed by you know individuals who who participate and and work to to change the the tone of the conversation. I think that I think that ally has sometimes become a bit of a dirty word in the communities that many of us are a part of, just because we've seen so many instances of very uh, large-scale public figures, Hugo Schweitzer, excuse me, um, <laughs> really kind of go down in flames over ultimately not being allies, but sort of garlanding themselves with this image that they are indeed sort of like, you know, we are the feminist men who are going to save yeah. the world and save the ladies. And like, that's not really the point, dude. But in spite of this and the skepticism that that has created, and it's valid and it has created some anxiety and anger, which is also valid, I am, will never be ready to junk the concept of an ally as some people in our communities have suggested. Because even though people do screw this up, it still is a profoundly valuable, not just valuable, but downright necessary role. You know, in the gaming industry, for instance, we do need the men, we do need the cisgender people, we do need the white people who are the majority in the industry yeah. to, do, to step up and to work with us. And the core piece of being an ally is to just see us as human. That's the first step whence everything else will flow, to see us as people mm -hmm. and work with us as such. And as long as you hold on to that, and as long as you're making sure that you are checking subconscious biases, because we all do that, where we regard the words of a woman differently from the words of a man who have said exactly the same thing, right? For instance, that as long as you are careful about them, thinking very, very critically, and using your own experiences, instead of saying, well, oh, well, this has happened to me too as a man, for instance, ergo, this is not a gendered problem. Turn around instead and say, well, if this made me feel like this, how can I use that emotion that that has generated in me to empathize better with the women or the queer people, et cetera, who are going through this. Let me use that negative experience that I've had to inform my allyship, for instance, rather than using it to defensively say, well, you know, well, I'm a guy and this happened to me, so, you know, and I think that that's, that's a good place to start, ultimately, in terms of being an ally. And, you know, any concerns about stuff like white knighting and so forth, just, <laughs> Let that roll off. That's, you know. You're probably doing something right if you're being called a white knight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and take it from somebody that role plays as a paladin. Um, <laughs> um, so I think the other thing is that allies are going to mess up. Yeah. It's going to happen. Um, and that's okay, right? The issue is if you're learning from that, if you're called out and you learn from it, right? So there's this, like, this sense of, but they're a nice guy or they're trying or whatever. And part of the issue is 
Trying involves actually like reading feminist literature. It means doing your own research. It means learning about these issues and not just expecting women and queer folks to correct you when you're wrong, right? Um, it takes effort to be an ally. And I'd like to see more of that, right? I'd like to see a lot more of that, especially in games. Um, the other aspect of this, though, I think is structural, right? We can't, we, one, we are responsible for creating a cultural shift, but structurally, we need like game sites to change the way that they handle comments and what they're posting and what they're sharing, right? We need, mm -hmm. we need like, we need, uh, we need developers to take responsibility for their communities, right? Like, what are their games telling their their community that's appropriate or not appropriate? How are their uh, how are their forums uh, allowing conversations to happen or not happen, right? What are all of, there's so many things, right? We could like brainstorm a million ways that we could create these structural changes, and creating structural change means people have to follow those structures, right? So I, that will in in addition to what we need to do to to help pressure companies to make those changes, um, they need to step up. So working at those companies and being like, hey, how about we do these things or suggest these ideas that will make it, make their spaces more inclusive. Well, Anita, really, if you, wa if you want games to change, you should just go and make your own game. <laughs> <laughs> just, just be done with it. Oh, okay. Yeah. My one game that I would ever make. <laughs> it will change the whole industry. Also, um, another quick thing about allyship Allyship is not just about what you say, important as that is, but sometimes it's also about what you don't say. That we all, when we're talking online especially, have these impulses to leap into a conversation and interrogate something that offends us or that makes us uncomfortable. And so if, for instance, you see something that, uh, you know, a very outspoken, perhaps even angry feminist saying something, your instinct may be to leap in and say, well, I disagree and blah, 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 but instead, Step back and think, analyze your emotions, analyze your feelings, ask yourself why you're feeling this, and be rational about it. Mm -hmm. You know, for all of the um, hatred that's directed against women for our purported irrationality, oftentimes it's the people who antagonize us that tend to get lost in mires of irrational thinking, right, and getting swept up in their emotions and so forth. And so they could do with taking a bit of their own advice. And sometimes stepping back is the best thing you can do too in a given situation. Thanks. Mm -hmm. oh. Oh. Um, so in the same sort of line of thought, one of the questions that came up was asking, how does um, the you aren't a real gamer critici criticism affect me? And I think that goes to everyone. I think it's bullshit, so it doesn't affect me. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's a tactic used to lob, it's, it's like lobbed at people to discredit them, but it's just, it's such garbage. Like anyone who believes that is dumb. Like if you play games, you're a gamer, like end of story. Um, and I think that, you know, when we talk about, like, there's another question about how you, how you distinguish between legitimate criticism and sexism or sexist remarks. Um, and I think that's a really good question and it can be complicated and it can be really easy. Now, one of the problems that happen, especially in my case and other sort of prominent women is, so like there are a core group of people who are harassing me and they make videos. And when I say videos, we're talking like, hundreds of videos, right? Like hours and hours of just ranting into a camera. That's probably why they wonder why it takes so long for me to make a video, because it takes them one hour to make a one hour video. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so, so they'll, they'll, they'll do these like long rants trying to find anything that they can possibly find to criticize me with and just to see what sticks, right? Um, and the problem, well, there's many problems with that, but one of the problems is that, that what they say gets parroted. Right, so a vi like a video will come out, and then I will get hundreds of messages with the exact same thing that that person said. Right, so right now we could check my Twitter feed, and I bet you it will tell me that I'm lying about Hitman Absolution because someone made a video two days ago about how I'm lying about this game, and now that's all I hear. Right, that's all I see. All the emails I get, um, and that's just one example. This happens on a weekly basis. So when you talk about like distinguishing legitimate and sexist criticism, you have to take into account the entire sphere of like what's orbiting around me. Um, I think that there are definitely legitimate criticisms and I listen to them and I try to acknowledge them and incorporate them where I can, um, but there's so much sexist shit. Like there's so much to go through um, that it's, 
it's, it can be really daunting and it can affect you at times. And other times I just shut it out because it's too much to deal with, right? And that's when I go to other people to help support me through that so that I'm not ignoring what's happening and I'm aware of what's going on in my, you know, in response to my work, but I need to take care of myself too. Also uh, on the question of self-care, there, are, there are, have been a couple of questions about that from uh, queer people in, in the audience here and, uh, and women that have been basically asking how they can participate in the community without fear of this sort of thing happening. And the honest answer that I can give is that it's gonna be very difficult to avoid it entirely. It saturates our culture to such an extent that if you're getting any attention at all, something from the most like benign ignorance statement to outright hatred is probably going to come up, especially if you're a content creator. But the important thing in participating online is to find your people, to find the community that will support you, to avail yourself of the resources that have been built through a lot of blood, sweat, tears, and long nights over ice cream and wine uh, that have been created for you for you to have a forum to talk about gaming, for you to have a website where you can read about gaming from a somewhat more feminist perspective or a queer perspective or both. And those places are where your people are at, where my people are at, and where I came up through the world of gaming after, as I grew into adulthood, after I transitioned. It was in websites and forums where I found my sisters, where I found people in the community that supported me and I could turn to whenever I experienced direct or indirect harassment or transphobia or homophobia or misogyny. And that made it a lot easier for me. And you will find, and I certainly don't want to make this sound like it's a grow a thicker skin thing because it absolutely isn't. But it, when you come into your own power with community at your side, it is a little easier to keep going in spite of the hatred because you're not alone and you're constantly reminded of the fact that you are not alone. And so and that's really the best advice I can give. I know it's not perfect. I mean, I think we're all living with the imperfection of that kind of advice every day. But I, I certainly also, every time I talk about harassment and write about it, I never wanted to discourage people from participating because that's part of how this sort of nonsense ultimately works. That's the labor it does in our culture, is to police the boundaries of space to keep women, people of color, people with disabilities, queer people out of those spaces that have been socially proscribed from them. And I'm not trying to reiterate that work. I'm saying that by mastering it through understanding what's happening and why it's happening, you can have more power. You can empower yourself to be a part of a larger community and stand tall against that kind of harassment. I do believe it is possible. So and, don't and, be afraid. Yeah, and, and hopefully as these communities build up, what, uh, what I hope will happen is that the barriers between the communities will ultimately slowly through a lot of toil and a lot of struggle will start to break down so that sites, the ma you know, major sites like the one that I write for will ultimately no longer be kind of, and, and games in general, will ultimately no longer be perceived as like primarily for, again, you know, straight men with these kind of satellite communities around that of, you know, and of this and that, these people and those people, but, but hopefully a more uh, welcoming and, and universal uh, that, that sites like like GameSpot and and games in general become places where where it, the, these are, these issues are less important and we can come together to experience and celebrate games together regardless so much of our of our <laughs> you know of our gen gender our gender identity our sexuality our all our all of these things. So we have five minutes left, uh -huh. I think. Um, 15. Oh, 15? Shit. OK. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'll do that. OK. Um, never mind. We have 15 <laughs> minutes left. Um, so one of the things that, uh, when we talk about online harassment, one of the big myths that always come up is anonymity, right? Like, if we just get rid of anonymity, or anonymity is the problem, so that'll solve everything. So Catherine. What do you think about that? Oh, yes. 
Um, so this is an issue that's very near and dear to me for a number of reasons. I think most relevant to this audience. How many of us remember the rather tragic rollout of Blizzard's Real ID program? Right. And I think uh, certainly as a trans woman who came up through World of Warcraft and who loved that game, uh, and there were a lot of us that were complaining about this because basically it turned Blizzard into another place, yet another place. Whereas a trans person, if you changed your name, you had to submit government documentation and so forth to them in order to get it changed in the game. Right, and so it was, you know, now for trans people, it wasn't just the DMV or social security or any other place, but now you also had to submit it to Blizzard, right? And you know, they got to see your revised birth certificate. Um, and that was uh, near and dear to me because what it was ultimately doing was policing and diminishing the community that had ultimately saved my life in some respects. You know, I was, I transitioned through World of Warcraft as I'm sure many trans people of a certain generation will tell you, role playing was a place where I could be myself when I was still being forced to live as the wrong gender. And I was able to you know, be a woman as part of a community and find my strength that way. And I wouldn't have been able to do that if my then legal name had been blasted out everywhere on the forums where I had a presence and so forth or in the game. And so like in the name of curbing harassment, it actually would have made the environment more poisonous for me and other trans people. You know, and that was something that Blizzard didn't realize when they were trying to implement this program. And I, I tell this lengthy anecdote because it's just one of a myriad of examples of how the crusade against anonymity, which is spearheaded by organizations that literally profit from a lack of anonymity like Facebook and so forth, uh, to just get rid of it because it's supposedly the source of all online hatred. But it isn't. Anyone that has been harassed will tell you that there are some people that write under their real names. Now, as a scholar of this sort of thing, I can tell you that there is occasionally a difference that manifests in non-anonymous harassment versus anonymous harassment. There are sometimes different characteristics to the both of them, but there's still harassment. They're still coming from the same place of hatred. And you see all the time, again, on Facebook itself, we've all seen poisonous, toxic Facebook threads where people are saying some of the most vile things imaginable, and there's their little selfie picture right next to it, right? And their legal name, and it's not stopping them. So it's not the source of the problem. Anonymity is an inflection on online harassment. It changes the character of online harassment in certain situations. In other situations, it may be an accelerant, but it is never the cause. The cause has to do, one, with a lack of accountability, which you can argue is related to anonymity, but I have complex thoughts about that. And two, just the moral culture in which people are stewing where this sort of thing is OK, where because we feel like so much of the internet is us shouting into a vacuum, that there are no consequences to our words, that it is ultimately a place where we can just scream at the universe. You know, Anita was talking about how she's been sort of dehumanized as this evil feminazi, right? We all, all of us that receive harassment get turned into little caricatures, right? Like someone in a, a B movie or a Michael Bay movie. And uh, Optimus Prime is a real character, okay? <laughs> Come on you get basically turned into this little cardboard cutout archetype. You are ultimately dehumanized, and you're just this dartboard that people can fling darts at all day and night to vent their spleens about whatever they feel. And the internet encourages this because it seduces you into thinking that you're not actually talking to real people. It's one of the issues that arises with Twitter. A lot of people use Twitter as sort of just their personal place to vent, even if they have 20,000 followers. And it's like you're not speaking speaking privately anymore, but people still treat it as this place where they can vent their spleen. And that's really the source of the problem in many ways, is that the ethics that we have around online behavior and online social interaction specifically discourage us from thinking that we are talking to actual people. And as gamers, how many of us growing up heard from our parents and relatives, that's not real? We've internalized that belief about gaming and gaming culture. 
that what we're doing, even though now we say, well, we would never say that to our kids and so forth, we've fundamentally taken on board the idea that this space is less real and ergo what happens there is a form of play. And a lot of online harassment in, for instance, multiplayer games is also specifically treated like that, that it's within this magic circle of play and that's just what you do, right? It's normal behavior to talk shit about people and when you're playing Halo or any other multiplayer game. This is baked into the normative ethics of online behavior. Anonymity is not the firing mechanism. It's just an inflection. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and that totally that concept of play comes in like that's why a lot of the harassment that we get the the people doing it are just the people doing it just say well it's just a game right, right? we're just wishing you death it's just a game god why are you taking this stuff so seriously um and i think that that directly comes out of that space of like well games are just play that's what we're taught in this space and therefore we can interpret like legitimate harassment as just a game right as just play um, but why are the you know the rules so different for how you can within that world of play talk to you know other men you know versus like women or you know anyone who's who is a woman or is perceived as a woman in you know a call, call of duty shooter online or whatever i mean they just get the most just the, misogynistic you know vitriolic hatred the that, answer is patriarchy <laughs> i i've heard of patriarchy yeah, it's a thing i've heard of I've heard and that's of the thing too is that like without a doubt like straight white cis men get harassment too but it's sure. not or they get you know mean things said to them right but it's <laughs> and it can't yeah it's harassment but it's not because of their gender it's not because of their any of their identity markers right yeah. whereas like the harassment of women is always tied to us being women right and one of the things that you said earlier about harassment and sort of trying to deal with it is that it's not about you yeah. and it's not it's not about me either it's about the fact that we're women speaking yeah like legitimately <laughs> and i know it's a funny thing to say but it's serious right like that when women speak up and this is age old, right? This is not new in games or anything that when we dare to have a voice, we, they, we need to be taken down, right? We need to be that quiet, subservient, like little girl that we are supposed to, that our culture tells us that we're supposed to be. And so the way that they attack us is based on our gender, right? Based on the horrible things that they could do to like scare us. And it, it works. How many, I don't know if you've experienced this, but I've gotten so many messages from women who are afraid to say anything, who are afraid to um, play games online, who, are, who have to mute themselves, who took down blog posts or videos because they were afraid of getting harassed because they saw what happened to me, right? What do you say to that? Because it is, it's an awful, really toxic culture. But the thing is that if we all, like I really liked what you were talking about with community because we do need to all step up. You can't just have one or two or three people who are doing this work. We all need to do this work in the ways that we feel like we can, right? Um, there are legitimate safety concerns. Uh, there are legitimate concerns about losing your job. But I think we can all figure out ways that we can engage and create a space where we have this large community that supports each other. Yeah, the English classicist Mary Beard has a remarkable piece up on the uh, London Review of Books about, that, about how this mentality about women needing to have our tongues cut out, literally or metaphorically, goes all the way back to antiquity and contextualizes that as sort of the ultimate uh, psycho-ideological source of a lot of our current problems, right? And it's a, a very good piece that I think demonstrates just the very long historical pedigree of this sort of thing, and it's a very real problem. Um, but I feel also, uh, in terms of enjoining the rest of the community to step up, that is a fantastic idea. I would definitely, to parallel what I was saying earlier about getting people to join us, right? Please do step up and stand with us. If you write about sexism or if you make a video about feminism or what have you, you will be standing with us, with an extant community. You can join us, one of us, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, it sounds like it's not so bad. We have nice jackets, so a, no dental plan. Cu cu cupcakes at all the meetings. Cup I would, gluten free cupcakes. Yeah, gluten free. Um, Okay, so we need to start wrapping up. Oh, should we do something fun to wrap up? 
I have no idea. Do did we plan anything fun? No, we didn't. <laughs> I hate fun. What are you talking about? I know. I know you do. But not more than me. No. Um, um. I think we said some hopeful things, yeah? It wasn't all depressing? Because I was like, maybe we should, okay. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, to, 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 you know, uh, to, to talk about hope for a moment, like, I, I really think that uh, I mean, when I, so my coming out sort of, I, um, I was female in the uh, GameSpot community for a long time before I was uh, a, before I lived as a woman. And I actually was, when I got hired at GameSpot that I said to myself, okay, well, now I, I cannot uh, keep being dishonest. This is like, the, this is the fork in the road and this is where I'm going to live my life as the person that I am. And that was, that was the moment for me. But you know, if you had told me a few years before that, that I could be that person, that I could be that person who is publicly trans in a community that would be hostile, I would have told you that you were, that you were crazy. I would have said that, that there's no way that I can be that person. I'm, I just don't have the, the internal fortitude to withstand the kind of scrutiny and hatred and nastiness that is going to go with that. But I, when the moment came, I felt like it was too big an opportunity to pass up, and I took it, and I found that that with the support of like-minded people, that I was able to, to be in these places and to do what I do. And so I would say to anyone, who, you know, to echo what Catherine was saying is, you know, you, you, the strength in, inside yourself may surprise you, right? You can, you can join these communities, and you can find a place to belong here. Um, I could also, to wrap up, do a very quick lightning round of some questions that I could answer. We have very few minutes. They're signaling me, so quickly. Should we? <laughs> um, very quickly. Someone asked a quick question about uh, gender parity in violence versus women in video games itself. So, like, replacing all of the, you know, male avatars, soldiers that you have to gun down with 50% women. A lot of... The idea, I think, behind some questions like this, I'm not casting any aspersions on the person who asked, but like, it's to sort of say that there is this like, hypocrisy in our advocacy, right? But every single article that I've ever read that has called for better gender representation of NPCs in video games, including those who get their heads chopped off, uh, has been a feminist article. Because ultimately, the idea that women cannot be hurt is a sort of sexist, chivalrous idea. That, and I've seen male gamers say, oh, well, of course, you know, there shouldn't be any women that I have to kill in Goldeneye because, you know, it'd be unmanly for me to kill a girl. That's the idea that prevents gender parity, not some kind of feminist hypocrisy. And, and this came up uh, at yester a panel yesterday. Um, and one of the things about that is I think that there is a legitimacy in that question. Like, I actually think it's important for to us to ask, like, will this perpetuate notions of violence against women? Will it sensationalize and glamorize it, right? And the issue, I think, comes down to, like, as developers, they can, cho they can choose mechanics and, and design elements that don't glamorize it, that don't sexualize it, right? So it's not, should we do it? It's, yes, we should do it. It's, how should we do it, right? How do we include gender parity in this way? One more? Yeah, so another person asked a question that I, I always love answering. I even get this at academic conferences is, quote, all of the guys who pretend to be a girl online, if that's a real phenomenon, possibly it's a hidden epidemic of these people not realizing they are transgendered women. Now, <laughs> I will say, I will say that because my father was, you know, a very uh, aggressively, angrily macho man, when I was you know, a kid and I would play as female characters, I would often have to lie to him by saying, and to my male friends, by saying, that, you know, oh, well, they're pretty. They're nice to look at. That's why I'm doing it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I hated myself even then for doing it. And that was even before I really identified as a feminist. But I was just doing it to keep myself safe. And I know that there are other trans women that had for a while identified as male in their day-to-day uh, -day lives, who, and, but played female characters all the way through. I don't know, though, if it qualifies necessarily as a quote-unquote um, hidden epidemic. I think that, 
the, you know, there's a whole range of realities that are happening there where, you know, indeed there are just some men that like to play as female characters. I've known plenty of guys who are cisgender and quite happy being cisgender, but just generally seem to favor female characters. And actually I've found that many of them as role players do a pretty damn good job of it because they actually are invested in, you know, respectful, comprehensive portrayals. Um, I don't think it has to be one or the other. I do think that you know certainly some trans women like myself have had to come up through gaming in this way, but there are also just guys who do play as women for various values, and so. And nor do I think it's an epidemic. I would love to see people feel more comfortable cross cross gender uh, role playing and so forth. I think that can ultimately be a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, I get so frustrated with the idea that we, that you know when men say about a game that has a female character i i can't relate to a female character when we as women have been you know by default identifying with male characters our in, you know our entire lives and we're all human beings and we have empathy and that should be something that we can all do but it it should also be able to go to go both ways so we are out of time yeah. but i just want to end on saying that and i think i can speak for us in that we love what we do right like we love games mm -hmm. and we go through all of this hell because we do right because we i think i think i don't mean to speak for you but at least for me like i think games have an enormous revolutionary impact or they can right i see the potential in games as something that can be incredibly inclusive as a space where we can discuss issues that can that can um, work towards social change in really meaningful ways, right? And that can be incredibly life-changing for people, and it is already in some ways, and it can be more. And so, you know, we talk a lot about really sad things and really, you know, representations and how bad it is, but, you know, we're doing it because we want it to be better. We want games to be better for everyone. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.